Well, first of all, let's talk about Moses striking the rock, and that's a story found in Numbers 20. In the first month, the whole community of Israel came to the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. And you read on a few verses later on, and um, Aaron died. And so the people are just coming up on the promised land. This is the, the end of the, the 40 years uh, wandering, or near the end. There was no water where they camped. So the people gathered around Moses and Aaron and complained. Surprise. It would have been better if we had died in front of the Lord's tent along with the other Israelites. And if you don't mind, I'm leaving off the rest of their complaining because I think we've, we've gotten a good enough sense of the complaining at, the, at this point. So we're going to skip forward to what God said to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, take the stick that is in front of the covenant box, and then you and Aaron assemble the whole community. There in front of them all speak to the rock over there, and water will gush out of it. In this way you will bring water out of the rock for the people, for them and their animals to drink. Speak to the rock, and water will come out. So he and Aaron assembled the whole community in front of the rock, and Moses said, Listen, you rebels. Do we have to get water out of this rock for you? And then Moses raised the stick and struck the rock twice with it. And a great stream of water gushed out, and all the people and animals drank. But the Lord reprimanded Moses and Aaron and said, Because you did not have enough faith to acknowledge my holy power before the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I promised to give them. And after all the discussion we've had about Moses, uh, who was God's friend, who spoke face to face with God as a man speaks to a friend, um, who defended God so many times, who on several occasions, as we've talked about, seemed like he was really the last person who was really on God's side. I mean, just think of Korah's uh, rebellion, uh, how even um, his brother and sister accused him. And doesn't this seem a little bit harsh? No, I said, speak to the rock, you struck it, and so you can't enter in. Um, how do we understand? Why was God so severe with Moses? Uh, apparently, uh, it would seem. Uh, well, we need to read around this and look into uh, the book of Deuteronomy, and if it's helpful, we can read other descriptions of this, where Moses would say, because of you, the Lord also became angry with me and said, not even you, Moses, will enter the land. And Moses pleaded with God. He really wanted to go into the promised land. At that time, I pleaded with the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, you have only begun to show your greatness and the strength of your hand to me, your servant. Is there any God in heaven or on earth who can perform such great and mighty deeds as you do? Please let me cross the Jordan to see the wonderful land on the other side, the beautiful hill country and the Lebanon mountains. But the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he would not listen to me. That's enough, he declared. Speak of it no more. Okay, and the book of Deuteronomy, of course, ends. We read this last time, but now we'll uh, include the, the full description. Then Moses went up to Mount Nebo, which is across from Jericho. Remember, that was the first city they conquered in the Promised Land. And the Lord showed him the whole land, extending all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. And then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter the land. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him. Isn't that interesting? God himself performed the burial. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but to this day no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and he didn't die of old age or heart failure. Uh, the description here is his eyesight was clear, he was as strong as ever. Okay, so um, our question here is, um, why was this uh, so significant that uh, God could not let Moses in? I mean, uh, you, you know, seems like we could maybe cut him some slack here for, for making one mistake and all of the good things that Moses did. Well, we, uh, we read about this in other places, surprisingly. In um, Psalms 106, we have this description. 
at the springs of Meribah, that's where this occurred, the people made the Lord angry, and Moses was in trouble on their account. They made him so bitter that he spoke without stopping to think. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is an example of Hebrew parallelism, but it, it almost seems like it to me. In, in Hebrew poetry, rhyme is uh, based on repetition. And so the second line adds meaning and depth to the first line. And so here are the, the springs which were bitter. And now we have the description here in the second sentence that Moses was made bitter. And he spoke without stopping to think. Okay, he lost his cool, got upset. Okay, but let's look back here. God's words command was to speak to the rock. Okay, and of course when we, uh, the, the story uh, as it played out is Moses hit the rock. What's the significance there? First of all, we need to acknowledge that Moses here had this uh, incredible um, authority. Despite the continual rebellion against Moses, uh, this was repeated a couple of times. Uh, remember when Moses was unsure whether he was really fit for this, God I mean, look at the power he invested in Moses. Aaron will be your spokesman and speak to the people for you. Then you will be like God, telling him, Aaron, what to say. Okay, so Moses really uh, was like God uh, to the people. And uh, this was repeated in, again in Exodus 7. Well, let's look at what Moses actually said. First of all, his words, listen, you rebels. Now, did God tell Moses and give them a good scolding before you uh, let the water come out of the rock? Um, it's interesting that on this occasion, you know, the people are rebellious as always, okay, but um, God just seemed to say, hey, just speak to the rock, give them water. Yeah, I mean, these people are uh, out of control, they're rebellious, but just speak to the rock, give them water. And uh, the people, again, seeing Moses as God's representative, see that this is the attitude that God had, has towards them. You know, they would see God uh, reflected here in Moses, and God's attitude uh, on this occasion was not to come to the people and say, listen, you rebels. Okay, he just told Moses, be gracious, give them water. Okay, Moses here certainly would seem to reflect um, uh, anger and hostility from God. Okay, by the way he came, listen, you rebels. Okay, but of course the other um, portion here is, do we have to get water out of this rock for you? Um, now, did Moses and Aaron get water from the rock? Okay, they would seem to be uh, almost taking credit for it here. And so the, the misrepresentation here, I think first of all as uh, describing God as angry, when God just said give them water, if we look at other translations of what God's rebuke to, to Moses in the New English Bible, it's, you did not, did not trust in me so far as to uphold, uphold my holiness in the sight of the Israelites. Or in the God's Word translation, you didn't trust me. You didn't show the Israelites how holy I am. In other words, you misrepresented me, Moses. I did not wish to be represented that way. You misrepresented me. And uh, it is really, if we're listing like most serious things, I think from a, from a biblical perspective, um, again and again, it seems to be misrepresenting God. Okay, if we uh, describe God in a way that is not the reality, that's extremely serious. And uh, we spent a long time talking about what happened at the tree. Wasn't that essentially what happened at the tree? A, a, a gross distortion, misrepresentation of God. The snake, the most cunning animal, asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? And God had just said, you may eat the fruit from every tree in the garden, except one. Okay, and the, the snake comes along and says, hmm, uh, too bad you can't eat any fruit in this garden. He's really not a God of freedom. And then, of course, he went on to say, God has lied to you. All right, so what happened in the, the human family, initially with Adam and Eve, it was a distortion, a gross misrepresentation of, of God and his character. All right, so, so it's extremely serious, number one, but I think the other point here is, do we have to get water out of this rock for you? Um, on, I would say, probably dozens of occasions when the people complain against Moses, the complaint is, Moses, why have you brought us out of Egypt? Why did, did you bring us out of Egypt to let us die in the wilderness? Why did you, Moses, bring us out? 
Um, that is the accusation over and over again that the people have. And these words of Moses almost seem to say, well, yeah, I did. Do I? Do we? Aaron and I have to get water from this rock? I mean, this, it's, it's hard to, uh, it almost seems like this is an accusation that could stick after this. That, yeah, it really was Moses who brought us out of Egypt. Um, and uh, I, I almost think God here almost had to go on record and say, no, I was the one who brought the people out of Egypt, not Moses. Uh, I'm the one who brought the water from the rock, not Moses. Okay, and how do you, how do you make that point? Um, certainly this would be quite shocking, I think, for the people. Uh, here, Moses doesn't get to go in. Okay, but, but I think this just had to somehow uh, be exposed as this is not at all the reality. And just as an example of that, remember when God said all the way back uh, at Mount Sinai, the people are dancing around uh, the golden calf, and God said, Moses, go back down because your people who you led out of Egypt have sinned and rejected me, and then I will make of you and your descendants a great nation. And we talked about how wonderful it was that uh, Moses here, his response was to tell God, no, that's really not how it is. Lord, why should you be so angry with your people? They're yours, not mine, whom you rescued from Egypt. Uh, why should the Egyptians be able to say that you led your people out of Egypt? Okay, and then as we read on in Exodus 33, Moses said, I'm willing to lay down my life um, for these people. Okay, that's, that's the right attitude. But on this occasion, uh, Moses got it uh, switched around. Well, does Moses have a case, then, to make against God? Uh, it's interesting. We talked about the relative absence of Satan in the Old Testament a few weeks ago. And so to, to polish this story off, we need to go to the New Testament. And surprisingly, here in the book of Jude, we read that even the archangel Michael did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. And this took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. Isn't that interesting? After the death here of Moses, that there is a conflict that Satan would even uh, try to make a case. Now you can't resurrect Moses. I mean, look at what he just did. Okay, but God did anyway, and we know that because, of course, uh, we have Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, and who is there? When Jesus changed, his face became as bright as the sun, his clothes as white as light, and suddenly... Moses and Elijah appeared to them, and we're talking with Jesus. And of course, Peter is uh, all befuddled, and then a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. Okay, so does Moses really have a, a grievance against God? I mean, God made a point, but he immediately resurrected Moses, and uh, wouldn't this be uh, quite an honored thing to be able to come down and talk to Jesus right before he's about to, to go out and die? I uh, wish we had the conversation. You know, what, what did uh, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus talk about? Uh, we have no description there. Uh, we might be able to speculate, though. Uh, both Moses and Elijah seem to have quite a meltdown at the very end of their uh, life. Um, we'll talk about Elijah later, but Moses, of course, broke down in anger um, here at the end. Is it possible that uh, they came to encourage Jesus and maybe to tell him, you know what, we, we flamed out in our moment of crisis here at the end, and uh, maybe to encourage him, who knows? But I think perhaps the more important point, at least from the perspective of, of the disciples, is that the Father would declare, in the presence of Moses, representing the law, Elijah, representing the prophets, that the Father would say, listen to him, uh, that would elevate Jesus here as the supreme authority. Well, that's another sermon, but um, anyway, I think when we take uh, what happened to Moses as a whole, uh, we can see that uh, Moses really has no complaint in, uh, in what's happened here. Now, we need to talk about our last story in Numbers here, the story of uh, a talking donkey and Balaam. Uh, we just, I want to read the story a little bit, and then uh, I think we'll try to mainly make a point about uh, Balaam in this story. So King Balak sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor. They brought him this message. I want you to know that a whole nation has come from Egypt. Its people are spreading out everywhere and threatening to take over our land. They outnumber us, so please come and put a curse on them for me. Then perhaps we will be able to defeat them 
and drive them out of the land. I know that when you pronounce a blessing, people are blessed. And when you pronounce a curse, they are placed under a curse. So the Moabite and Midianite leaders took with them the payment for the curse, went to Balaam, and gave him Balak's message. Now, who are the Moabites? Uh, remember when Lot fled from Sodom and his daughters got him drunk? That, uh, that those two children were the Moabite, became the Moabites and the Ammonites. Okay, the Moabites, remember, worship uh, Baal. Okay, Baal, as we know from the story of Elijah, that uh, when you worship Baal, uh, remember, they cut themselves, much flowing blood, they shouted louder, uh, tried to get his attention. Okay, so these are the Moabites. And uh, so as the children of Israel coming into the Promised Land, they're afraid of uh, this group of people. So Balaam said to them, Spend the night here, and tomorrow I will report to you whatever the Lord tells me. And what's interesting here is the word that Balaam uses is not the generic uh, word for God, Elohim, but he uses the personal name for the God of the Israelites, Yahweh. Now it's kind of surprising that he would say, whatever the Lord uh, tells me. Now, do you wonder here, what was Balaam expecting to hear from God? Uh, what prayer was he perhaps working on? Um, Dear God, these people have come to curse your people. Uh, what should I do? Okay, it's interesting uh, to think of what did, he, what did he expect? People coming to curse God's own people. So if the Moabite leader stayed with Balaam, and God came to Balaam and asked, who are these people that are staying with you? It's an interesting how many times God asks questions that he knows the answer to. Uh, but he answered, well, King Balak of Moab has sent them to me, has sent them to tell me that a people who came from Egypt has spread out over the whole land. He wants me to curse them for them, for him, so that he can fight them and drive them out. And by the way, I'm going to get a lot of money if uh, this works out just right. He leaves out uh, that part of the story. And God said to Balaam, do not go with them and do not put a curse on the people of Israel because they have my blessing. Now, it's interesting when Balaam now, listen to what he's going to tell uh, these Moabite leaders, doesn't actually tell them exactly what God said. God said, don't put a curse on them um, and don't go with them. Okay, and when Balaam spoke to the men the next morning, uh, he said, go back home. The Lord did not give me permission to let me go with you. He didn't make it certainly as forceful as God said. God said, I can't curse them and I can't go. And he kind of says, well, I didn't get permission can't go. And so they returned and told uh, Balak that Balaam had refused to come with them. Then Balak sent a larger number of leaders who were more important than the first. And they went to Balaam and gave him this message, please don't let anything prevent you from coming to me. I will reward you richly and do anything you say. Please come and curse these people for me. Now would you need to ask God a second time? No, it's pretty clear. I mean, do you need to go back and uh, get, uh, maybe there's uh, additional information. Okay, but he answered, and it seemed quite uh, piously here, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not disobey the command of the Lord my God, the Lord my God, in even the smallest matter. But please, spend the night, as the others did. Let's uh, think this over a little bit. Uh, so that I may learn whether or not the Lord has something else to tell me. I think he's really wanting to go. And that night, God came to Balaam and said, If these men have come to ask you to go with them, get ready and go. Does that mean God approved? But do only what I tell you. And so the next morning, Balaam saddled his donkey and went with the Moabite leaders. Okay, so they all went together. But God was angry, even though he just said, okay, go ahead and go. Uh, but he didn't really want Balaam to go. God was angry that Balaam was going. And as Balaam was riding along on his donkey, accompanied by his two servants, the angel of the Lord stood in the road to bar his way. When the donkey saw the angel standing there holding a sword, it left the road and turned into the fields. Balaam beat the donkey and brought it back onto the road. And then the angel stood where the road narrowed between two vineyards, and had a stone wall on each side. And when the donkey saw the angel, it moved over against the wall and crushed 
Balaam's foot against it. Again, Balaam beat the donkey. And if you're the Moabite leaders, you might kind of wonder here, this uh, great man Balaam who can curse or bless people uh, can't control a donkey very well, it would seem. Okay, so once more, the angel moved ahead. He stood in a narrow place where there was no room at all to pass on either side. And this time, when the donkey saw the angel, it lay down. Balaam lost his temper and began to beat the donkey with his stick. And it's almost like uh, we could make a point from this that, um, you know, hey, Balaam, uh, your donkey can see that this is not a good idea, uh, but you can't. Okay, and then the Lord gave the donkey the power of speech. And it said to Balaam, what have I done to you? Why have you beaten me these three times? And Balaam answered. <laughs> now, yeah, it is funny here. He's, he's so out of control, uh, upset. He's not even realizing that he's talking to a donkey. Uh, because you've made a fool of me. If I had a sword, I would kill you. And the donkey replied, am I not the same donkey on which you've ridden all your life? Have I ever treated you like this before? Well, no, he answered. Um, <laughs> doesn't seem to quite um, sink in yet. He's, he's in this conversation. And then the Lord let Balaam see what the donkey could see. The angel standing there with his sword, and Balaam threw himself face downward on the ground. And the angel demanded, why have you beaten your donkey three times like this? I have come to bar your way, because you should not be making this journey, even though I allowed you. This, this was not my plan. But your donkey saw me and turned aside three times. If it hadn't, I would have killed you and spared the donkey. Balaam replied, I have sinned. I did not know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. But now, if you think it is wrong for me to go on, I will return home. And we just read, you should not be making this journey. How many times does Balaam need to be told, this is a bad idea? And now he's still asking, well, if you think it's wrong, I'll go back. But the angel said, well, go on with these men, but say only what I tell you to say. And so Balaam went on with them. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went to meet him. Balak said to him, why didn't you come when I sent for you the first time? Did you think I wasn't able to reward you enough? And Balaam answered, um, uh, again, it seemed very pious here. I came, didn't I? But now, what power do I have? I can say only what God tells me to say. And you know the story, how he sacrificed seven bulls, and he was standing over the Israelite camp, and he's supposed to uh, curse them. Okay, and I'll just um, give some excerpts. Four times he went up and said things uh, about the Israelites. Here from the first passage. From the high rocks I can see them. I can watch them from the hills. They are a nation that lives alone. They know they are blessed more than other nations. The descendants of Israel are like the dust. There are too many of them to be counted. Let me end my days like one of God's people. Let me die in peace like the righteous. I mean, Balaam really had a, was given here a, a pretty clear picture um, of uh, that God was really with these people. And so, Balak again tried to, okay, we'll do it again, but maybe from this part, now maybe you can only see the back of the camp. Let's see if that works. And so from his second passage, now he talks about God a little bit. He would say, God is not like people who lie. He is not a human who changes his mind. Whatever he promises, he does. He speaks and it is done. I have been instructed to bless, and what God blesses, I cannot call it back. Okay, so Balak again, okay, let's try it over here. And uh, interestingly here from the, the third of these uh, prophecies, Balaam would say this, the nation is like a mighty lion. When it is sleeping, no one dares wake it. Whoever blesses Israel will be blessed and whoever curses Israel will be cursed. And now Balak has had it and he says, get out of here, go back home. I promise to reward you richly, but the Lord has kept you from your reward, which is what he desperately wanted. Okay, but Balaam has one more thing to say. Then he uttered this prophecy. The message of Balaam, son of Beor, the words of the man who can see clearly, who can hear what God is saying and receive the knowledge that comes from the Most High. With staring eyes, I see in a trance a vision from Almighty God. I look into the future and I see the nation of Israel, a king like a bright star 
will arise in that nation. Like a comet, he will come from Israel. And uh, the Jewish people, as they look forward to the coming Messiah, this was one of the key uh, messianic prophecies. It's interesting, even just in the books of Moses so far, we've come across several. Um, of course, God's words in the Garden of Eden, that someone would come to crush your head. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but Jacob, on his deathbed, talked about the scepter that would come through the line of Judah. Um, and I think last time we talked about uh, Moses saying that a prophet will come like me. And again, that was seen, seen to be a messianic. And here, even in the words of Balaam, uh, we have a hint about this. Okay, so what can we say here about the story of Balaam? Well, uh, as always, don't stop reading. This is the next chapter, the very next story. And it would seem unrelated, uh, but it's actually really important to our understanding. When the Israelites were camped at Acacia Valley, the men began to have sexual intercourse with the Moabite women who were there. The Moabite women, Remember, these were the Moabites who were trying to curse Israel. These women invited them to sacrificial feasts where the god of Moab was worshipped. The Israelites ate the food and worshipped the god of Baal, and so the Lord was angry with them. And as we've tried to describe God's anger as his turning away, he's not there. And 24,000 people, uh, it was more than 20,000 people died in what happened here over the rest of this chapter. Now, how does that relate to Balaam? Well, if we just keep reading on, we find out that Balaam was behind this. In Numbers 31, remember that it was the women who followed Balaam's instructions. And at Peor, led the people to be unfaithful to the Lord. That was what brought the epidemic on the Lord's people. And so again, Balaam didn't get his money. Um, he, uh, the, what he wanted so desperately, uh, he was not allowed to curse the people, and so he came up with another way. And the other way was, uh, well, let's, let's trap them then. I mean, despite, look at all the prophecy. I mean, he knew that God was with these people, had blessed these people, about this coming king, all of these things that were clear to him. Okay, but the, the hope of money uh, overrid all of that, and so he came up with a trap. This even comes up in the book of Revelation. Surprisingly, Balaam in Revelation. Okay, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. Okay, so I think if we take the whole Bible, we see that uh, Balaam was behind this, and he was behind it for money. Look, now we are in, here in 2 Peter, talking about Balaam still. Or Peter would say, they have left the straight path and have lost their way. They followed the path taken by Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the money he would get for doing wrong and was rebuked for his sin. His donkey spoke with a human voice and stopped the prophet's insane action. Okay, so, um, now one more. Here, back in Jude again. Twice, two verses in Jude, one Bible study. How terrible for them. They have followed the way that Cain took. For the sake of money... They have given themselves over to the error that Balaam committed. Okay, so what was the error that Balaam committed? Um, I think ultimately, uh, the problem that Balaam had is there was something else that was the center of his life other than God. And for him, uh, that focus was money. Okay, it could be lots of things, but he derived life from money. Okay, and in the end, if, if that's the most important thing, it, it's going to come out in some way. Balaam had a sad end. We read in uh, Joshua that the Israelites also killed Balaam, son of Beor, who used magic to tell the future. And so he was killed eventually. Okay, so I think the lesson for us, perhaps, in this uh, story, you know, Jesus would say you can't be a slave of two masters. You will hate one and love the other. You'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so people, it, it's very easy to, to try to get our life from something other than God. Okay, we can try to get our life from the approval of others, the praise of others, and some people spend their whole life uh, in lustful search 
of the praise, approval, appreciation of others. Could be money. Um, could be uh, something as harmless as uh, an NFL football team. I mean, but if that is the most important thing, if that's what we derive our life from, it, it will eventually uh, lead to our ruin. Um, it's interesting, kind of the parallels between Balaam and Judas. I mean, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 measly silver coins. You know, I mean, that, that would seem, uh, was that really that important? You know, Judas stole money from the money bag. No one seemed to know about it. Um, but that was seemingly more important to him. And so um, in the book, I don't know how many of you have read such a wonderful book, The Screwtape Letters. Uh, we see in people like Balaam and Judas, a major meltdown, obvious public disaster. Everyone can see it. Look what happened to Balaam. Look what happened to Judas. Okay, but for most individuals where something replaces God as the center uh, of their life. It doesn't lead to something spectacular, okay? It's kind of a quiet life, that where the spiritual life dies away. And in this book here, uh, where C.S. Lewis uh, writes about two devils communicating, talking about the best way to tempt humans, okay? And so the, uh, the advice here of the senior tempter, who is screw tape to the understudy, is this. Okay, because the, the, the person wants to get his man to do great, terrible sins. But the advice is, well, you will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. And the enemy is God in this case. Remember, it's written from the devil's perspective. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Um, and so it uh, seem harmless, it almost seems, but again, the major point is what is our source of life? Where do we derive our life from? And that's, that's idolatry, really. Anything that replaces God at the core is idolatry. I mean, if I could just close with the words of Eugene Peterson. Um, he has some uh, commentary in, in the latest uh, Message Bible where you can get his uh, little notes. And this is what he said about the story of Balaam, which I, I thought was interesting. This story is a warning against religious eloquence, our own or someone else's. Balaam had a great reputation as a man of God. He was both knowledgeable and eloquent, but it was all show. His oratory was all in his mouth, not in his heart. He has nothing inside. He was undoubtedly talented. He made a fine impression, but there was no substance to him. He was a hollow man. What he really wanted to do was please whoever was paying him or admiring him. Balaam said all the right things, but he did all the wrong things. If you take only what Balaam said, he sounds like one of the great men of God, prophetic, poetic, sincere. But his life was all greed, ambition, and selfish gain. It's one of the easiest styles for Christians to pick up, this learning to sound righteous, then letting appearance substitute for a life of obedience to God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I just pray for each person here <clears throat> that what is most important to us where our thoughts dwell, where our, our longings, where they really are, that uh, this would be you, that you would be uh, the center, that you would be where we derive our life. We would not seek great opinions of other people about us, but rather we would define ourselves by the love that you have for us. Amen.